people about winter sewing because it is so much fun and it's a great way for uh, getting started with all kinds of plants uh, to get a jump on spring. And uh, I think the person who invented winter sewing was uh, a gardener who was itching to get outside and work in the garden and it was too darn cold and came up with this great activity that you can do inside and then you take it outside afterwards. So uh, it's fun, but in truth, um, who invented winter sowing is the plants themselves because any plant that grows in, in our neck of the woods up here in New England uh, naturally sows its seeds in the fall and they undergo a period of cold before they germinate in the spring. And so what we're doing with winter sowing is we're kind of uh, mimicking that same action and the, doing what the seed wants to do naturally, but uh, doing it in a way that ensures uh, a higher degree of success and more seedlings, which is always good. So I know that uh, for those of you who signed up uh, early, got uh, three packets of seedlings. And um, when, uh, when you got your seedlings, and I'm sure that they were all labeled individually, so you know that you've got three different kinds here. And I will tell you that two of the kinds that you got are really special. They are, shall we say, very native to Connecticut because the seeds were gathered by um, the, um, uh, uh, New England uh, Organic Farmers Association is sponsoring an eco-region project to discover and disseminate more seeds that have actually uh, come genetically from our very region, which is eco-region 59, which is a coastal area of New England that includes this part of Connecticut. And they gathered these seeds and uh, it is their hope by sharing them with folks like uh, like you all, that we will be getting more of our very own native seeds back into our very own gardens, and uh, which is a, a very natural and perfect fit for the uh, native pollinators who uh, frequent our gardens. So um, you've got, you should have gotten uh, three kinds of seed. There is New York ironweed, and this is a beautiful plant. It blooms toward the end of the summer. Uh, beautiful magenta blossom. And I'll be sending you, or Pat will be sending you tomorrow, a fact sheet that shows pictures of what the flower looks like and uh, detailed instructions about the best, uh, best spot in your garden that would go in and, and so forth because it's on the tall side. Pollinators love this plant. Uh, and um, it's... Uh, just as I said, a very beautiful magenta color. Um, then you get, then you have what's called coastal plain Joe pie weed. You may have heard of it. It also is a tall plant, more of a dusty rose, uh, also extremely beloved of pollinators. You'll see, and it, you know, it's a tall fella Joe pie and, and you'll want to put it toward the back so it doesn't shade uh, your front flowers, but it's, it's a great one for the garden. Um, both of these, they like about six hours of sun uh, a day. I mean, they'd love eight. Uh, they'd pout a little if you only gave them four hours of sun a day. So don't put them in the shade, but if you have a part shade, part sunny spot, they should do fine. Um, and all of this is in the fact sheet. I'm just kind of getting you in the mood. Um, and the last one is swamp milkweed. And this is a mix of pink and white, uh, the seeds, the, there are swamp milkweed that are pink and some that are white. I gave you a mix of both so you can uh, see, which, uh, see which one you like better. And um, people who know me know that I'm a little bit nuts when it comes to monarch butterflies. And uh, the reason that I include the swamp milkweed, this wasn't gathered by the Eco Region Project, it was gathered by me uh, from my own garden. And uh, these seeds, uh, give rise to milkweed, which is the only plant that the mama monarch lays her eggs on. It is the only plant that a monarch caterpillar can eat. So if you don't have milkweed growing in your garden, 
Uh, the adults may stop to nectar, but they won't be able to lay their eggs for the next generation. So I encourage everybody to grow at least a little bit of milkweed in their gardens. So uh, that's why I uh, selected this trio of seeds for you. Uh, and if you don't have your seeds ready tonight, um, just listen along and uh, you can do these. I'll explain as I go how you can also use winter sowing for many different um, types of seeds, and which is great. Uh, even things for your garden, uh, for your veggie garden, like lettuce, uh, plants that like to start in cold weather are fantastic things to start uh, using the winter sowing techniques. So let's get started. So Joe Pie Weed is, is a, has a rose colored bloom. Um, and I uh, don't know how well you can see from this, the picture. I always take pictures of the flowers on top of my seed jars to help me remember uh, what they're going to look like when they bloom. But uh, it's a, a tall plant uh, with kind of these clusters of blossoms uh, at, at the top of the plant. And this is what the pollinators just love to hang out on. So that's, that's the Joe Pie. Okay. I mentioned to you all, and, and as I said, I know some of you did, uh, didn't, uh, didn't get to register before we ran out of seeds. So um, when you get your, your uh, little uh, PDF uh, in the email tomorrow, you can either um, seek out these particular kinds of seeds. And I know that you can order them from Prairie Moon Nursery. That's P-R-A-I-R-I-E, Moon, M-O-O-N. Um, and they have these native varieties. They're a great uh, seed source for native varieties and you could get some from there. Uh, or you could um, take any, basically any uh, native flower that you like, uh, you can get the seeds for. You can go through the Prairie Moon catalog and you'll notice that they have a little code on the seed that if it says C30, or C60, that means it needs cold at least 30 days of cold or 60 days of cold. So if, if you go through the Prairie Moon seed catalog um, and look at the seeds that they have there and you like a flower and if it says germination code C30 or C60, it's perfect for winter sowing. So that's how you know you're getting the right thing for this and then you can pick whatever flower you like. So, um, Meanwhile, tonight, I mentioned to you that you should um, save your bottles and uh, uh, somebody in our house drinks a lot of seltzer. So we have a lot of these bottles and I always save them, but that isn't the only kind you can get. Um, you can use a gallon milk jug. You can use, uh, let's see, I have a, you use a half gallon milk jug. Um, as long as it's not opaque. This is translucent, light, light gets through. People say, can I use a green soda bottle? They've worked, I've had people try it and it works, but the light doesn't get through. The idea is this works like a mini greenhouse or a cold frame and the light needs to pass through the bottle to get to the seeds because a lot of what makes a seed germinate is cues that it's getting from daylight length. So, um, and, and all seeds uh, need light. That's, uh, that's how the plant does its photosynthesis. So, so um, grab any bottle if you're, if you're uh, working along with me. If you don't, just watch. <clears throat> I'm showing you here, this is, this is my demonstration bottle. And it shows what we are doing is we are going to make a cut all the way around except for a one inch spot on one side of the bottle. And that creates a hinge. And the hinge allows us to put the soil in, put the seeds in, close it, close it up, um, and uh, then open it uh, come springtime. But if you, uh, um, don't have that in a pinch, you can use like those deli salad containers, if you know what I mean, the big square boxes. 
what we're after is we like a soil depth of at least four inches because these plants that you're sowing um, like to have room for their roots to get growing. And sometimes you'll see the roots are, have gotten quite a start before anything even shows up above the, the top of the soil level. So um, if you've got one of those sort of deli salad boxes, clear deli salad boxes, that will work in a pinch. You could do the same things that you're doing with this. Uh, I just like this a little better. Um, holds a good amount of seed. So we're going to start, uh, start with, and uh, if you've got a ruler handy, great. If you don't, just eyeball it. But what I like to do is take a ruler and I take my little marking pen and I find the five inch spot because that's where I want to make my line. Assuming if you've got a bottle where you can't quite get up to five inches, that's okay. But anyway, so I go through and I make my mark all the way around the bottle to show the five inch spot, except for I stop short, I make that one inch, I mark one inch is don't cut there, stop cutting. Don't you don't want to cut the whole thing off because then you don't have a hinge to help hold it together. So once you've made your hinge all the way around, um, the other thing that you're going to do to this bottle, if you've got some white tape, I strongly recommend I put a piece of white tape on the bottom of the bottle and I wrote the seed that I'm going to put in this bottle. You don't have to do this. You can just write it on the outside. Sometimes it fades. So having it on the bottle, on the bottom of the bottle, not going to fade. So that's just a little extra thing. You'd be surprised. It's not just a rookie mistake. Some of us winter sowers come out in spring and discover that the labels have faded off all our bottles and then it's mystery plant time. So I recommend that you put a, an extra label on the bottle um, if you've got some, some tape to do it with. Uh, so we're gonna do that. We're gonna label whichever pack of seed you're starting with. And the other thing you wanna do, and I mentioned in my directions to have something sharp. You need to poke holes in the bottom. This is the all important step for drainage. We leave the lids off, the rain comes in, that's part of the, 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 the natural process of the cold, moist treatment the seeds need. And if you didn't have drainage holes in the bottom, the thing would fill up with water and you drown your seeds, which would be a fail. Uh, so very important, I have, I have already poked five holes in the bottom of this. And I have this lovely sharp uh, sit, pair of sciz sewing scissors. Um, a manicured scissor with a sharp point works really well too. You just kind of poke it down in there and turn it around. I've been told a soldering gun is great for making these holes. I don't have one, but you might. Um, the, uh, the thing about uh, winter sawing you may have noticed is that we like to use things over again. This is this is my way of um, reduce, reuse, recycle is uh, finding new uses for things that would uh, otherwise uh, go into recycling. So we're going to reuse these and put it in recycling later, I guess. Anyway, you got your holes in the bottom. To cut, to cut around the bottom takes Sometimes it's a little tricky getting the first cut started. Now, if you have a box cutter, sometimes I like to just get the cut started with a box cutter, if you have one. If you don't, just take a good pair of kitchen shears and dig in with it. But I like the box cutter makes it a little easier. And then you just cut around. So you cut all the way around like this. And when I get almost all the way around, I come to the spot where I put that mark for my hinge. And that's where I know better time to, it's time to stop. So I've got a bottle hinge. Um, this one I haven't put the holes in yet. So I'm gonna go back to my first bottle and keep going with that. So when you have 
your holes in on the bottom, your marking, you're ready to go. Now it's time to put your soil in. Now here's a little word about the soil. Any old potting soil is fine for this really. My preference is an or I buy an organic potting soil and I make sure that they haven't uh, added fertilizers to it. You know, when a seed is an amazing little package, um, when the seed germinates, it has fertilizer that the plant need food that the plant needs already built into the seed. So it doesn't need fertilizer to start off. Um, and uh, it also doesn't need those water crystals that they sometimes put in there, those moisture granules. Um, just go for the straight potting soil. But if, you know, use what you have, just don't use garden soil. Garden soil will get too compacted in here. Uh, it's not really aerated enough for what you're trying to do here. So, so anyway, um, the other thing that you do is that I scoop some out of the bag and I put it in this bucket and I pre-moistened it and I mixed it all around. Now by pre-moistened, this is not sopping wet. It's moist, not sopping wet. You make it sopping wet, you're just gonna end up with mud all over your table when you start filling these bottles and they start draining out the bottom. So um, hope you didn't make it sopping wet, but I hope it's a little bit wet. Anyway, if it's not, um, just give it a quick sprinkle. I love my cute little watering can and I can always add a little water to this if I think it's it's not quite moist enough and I can always add water after you've got everything in here too. So you're going to put put your soil in the bottom of the container and you want to come up pretty close to your cut line because the soil settles a little bit and you're also going to pat it down a little bit. So notice how handy this is. I just have my hand in the bottleneck like this keep it from flopping back on me while I fill it up. And see, I managed to get dirt on my kitchen table anyway. That's par for the course with me. That's why I have a drop cloth here. Um, anyway, when I've got it pretty close to filled up to the top, then I'm gonna give it just a little bit of gentle patting down, just smoothing it down. We are sowing some pretty tiny seeds today in part. And um, because we're sowing tiny seeds, um, you know, you kind of want a pretty smooth surface. Um, okay, so the first, so this is my, I decided to do my swamp milkweed first, which is probably the easiest seed to sow. Um, if you start with your swamp milkweed, because this is a pretty big seed. Um, you should have enough seed to do about 20 seeds per bottle like this. Now, if you have a great big milk bottle, you would have room to do more than that, but you could just spread them out too. Um, but 20 is a good number. They don't all sprout. Don't expect them all to sprout, but that by giving you 20 seeds, that's why I make sure that you're gonna get some successes. So I'm just gently dropping these around on the top of the soil like this. Now, here's, here's a, a rule of thumb that you can always remember and keep in mind is uh, if you wanna know how deep to sow some seed and the seed didn't come with any directions. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But if you don't know how deep to sow your seed, you go, about the thickness of the seed itself. So some seeds are teeny tiny. That means you barely dust them with soil. These milkweed seeds, as you can see, are a little bit, they're big, but they're flat. They're kind of skinny. So I'm gonna put less than a quarter of inch of soil on top of here and I just kind of do it by just lightly, lightly sprinkling the soil on the top. Just barely covering the seed. You don't want to weigh down in there. They don't want to have to work. You'll see when they, when they start popping up, they practically push themselves out of the soil anyway. And their roots always know to go down and their little leaves 
no to gum up. Okay, so you got you got your you patted your seed in. We'll just put a little bit more in. Some of them are sticking out a little bit too much. Okay, so that's it. So this is now ready. Now you heard me mention labeling it. This is the other thing I do. So, um, and if you don't happen to have, I get these nice big um, kind of, we used to call them popsicle sticks from, um, from Michael's. But again, improvisation and reduce reuse is what we're all about here. I keep getting these chopsticks in our takeout um, and I had a lot of leftover chopsticks and it dawned on me that it makes a great uh, little label. You just have to write a little bit more neatly because you have to write small, but it works. And so you can put, you can use chopsticks or if you had a, like a leftover plastic tag from, from a plant you bought last year, or you could put some tape on it and reuse that, whatever. The point here is why am I so um, making such a big point about labeling? It's the darndest thing. They, they, things happen. One label gets lost. You're moving the plant. The stick falls out, and you're like, "Darn, where? You know, what is it?" Or, or it fades or something. This is your insurance that you're not going to uh, forget what you put in the bottle. Um, the other thing that I always put on um, the stick when I put it in here is the date, because later on, you know, this is a, there's a lot of of uh, variability in when you might put your seed out. And it's kind of interesting. Sometimes you say, wow, the stuff I put out in January did, a lot, did better than the stuff I put out in February or vice versa. It's just interesting to know. So I always put the date um, and then I put the number of seeds that are in here um, because then when very few of the, if, if, very, if a whole bunch of them sprout, then you can say, oh, I put 20 in and 20 germinated. Well, that's 100% germination rate, pretty darn good. So I'm gonna write down here that I put in um, 20 seeds. So now I have the information that I'm gonna wish I had handy on this little stick, and I'm gonna put it in here. Later on, I use these little sticks to prop the lid open. We'll talk about that when we get, get done with this but um, I use it to prop the lid open when the war weather turns warm. Um, so in it goes, and I pop it over the top, and this is ready to get sealed up. So my trusty tape gun that I use, uh, but any kind of package sealing tape is good for this. People use duct tape. I like the clear tape because I want as much sunlight to reach the bottles as possible. So I like this and I just bring it around like so, seal it up. One more piece for good measure. And presto, I am ready to go. Now, when I put this outside, um, condensation is gonna show up on the inside of the bottle really quickly. Sometimes within minutes of when I put it outside in the cold, the condensation forms, which is nice. Um, that's a way that you can tell at a glance that um, there's enough moisture in, in the bottle. Um, so it, watch for that condensation, okay? Um, Pat, I saw you keep on, did, does somebody have a question? Yes, um, Kara asked if you can use a quart milk jug or is that too small? Um, a quart is kind of tiny, kind of tiny um, because a quart gives you a lot less surface area than this, but you know what? Give it a try. Maybe only put 10 seeds in so they won't be quite so crowded. Um, but if that's, I know people, some people have been in a panic state with me. They're like, I don't buy soda. I don't, you know, we don't, nobody in our house, you know, we don't, we, um, we buy paper cartons. And so um, improvisation, I will tell you that 
there's a wonderful group of winter sowers on Facebook. If you just type in winter sowers on Facebook, you'll see this group. And that group will do, I've seen them use anything for winter sowing because they're, I mean, some of, some of the people and gardeners in the group do put out a hundred bottles of things. And they're basically, they're, they're out raiding their neighbors recycling to get more bottles, but they will, they will use anything. So, so these are my preferred things because I like, um, I like the size, I like what it holds, but there's no hard and fast rule that a quart, uh, quart size bottle wouldn't work. So. That's the okay. only question right now. Okay. Is there another one, Pat? No, no. Okay. okay. All right, so the next thing I want to show you, tell you a little bit about these seeds, um, the next seeds that we are going to do, um, which if I'm going to do it, before I do it, give me a second, I got to poke holes in here, or I'll be mad at myself later. Um, you really don't forget to poke the holes before you put the soil in, because otherwise it's kind of messy. So. I'm getting my holes in for nice drainage. So by the way, if you did have a gallon of milk container, um, put about, like this has five holes in a gallon milk container, I would go for 12 or a dozen because there's a lot more surface area, needs, needs more, uh, more drainage holes relative to the surface area. Okay, so um, here we have another bottle ready to receive. It's now, I did, I didn't get around to putting my white tape label on this, so I'm just going to quickly put, I'm doing the Joe Pye next, so I'm going to put Joe And Pye. Alice, yes. someone asked if these are perennial seeds. Yes, they are. Yes. Um, so you are, and, and I'm so glad you asked that because, uh, because these are perennials, not annuals, like annuals or zinnias and marigolds and things like that, they they bloom and they're done in a single summer. Um, and those are warm climate plants, by the way. But these are perennials, which will come back again and again in your garden. And um, we gardeners have a saying with perennials, the first year they sleep, the next year they creep, the third year they leap, which is a way of telling you that this plant is not gonna get huge its first year. So you can, um, it, it's just going to act like a, a seedling and it may not even bloom, um, but it will, um, it's all the actions going on underground with the roots. So um, uh, that's something to keep, keep in mind when you plant it, you're going to put it someplace where you know where it is uh, because it'll be a, a small plant rather than a big bushy plant like it will be in succeeding years and you don't want to forget it's there or mistake it for a weed. Oh. So, and um, Irene is asking, this much, she might be getting ahead of, of you, but how long does a milkweed take to grow before you have to take it out and how do you take it out? How long does a milkweed have to grow before you take have it to out? Take it out. And then how do oh, you oh, take it oh, out? Oh, 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 to pot it up. Yes. I am gonna I'm gonna explain, I'm gonna get to that um, after we finish with this uh, with sowing the seed on this one. Um, I am gonna explain about um, what we call that, yes, it's called potting up. Um, when it's ready, when it's outgrown its, its little container here. Um, and the good news is you don't have to take notes like crazy because that information is in the handouts that um, the library will be sending you tomorrow. So we're, we will be good. Um, so um, the next thing, and again, I'm just going to kind of smooth this down a little bit because we're getting to the Joe Pye seeds are tiny. And what you'll notice when you get your Joe Pye seeds out uh, in your New York ironweed seeds is that they're very similar to each other. They both have, um, this is gonna be so tiny. I'm gonna hold it right up to the camera and see if you can see it. Um, you'll see the fluff on each seed. 
Can you see that? So that fluff is called pappus. Um, these seeds are dispersed by wind and that little piece of fluff helps the seed travel. Um, and uh, in, your, in your seeds, you may see some things that look like they might be seed, but if they're not attached to a little piece of fluff, that's just chaff. It's not, uh, it's not the business end of the seed, if you will. So the fluff has attached to it, looks like a little man in a parachute, um, a little tiny slit brown seed that tapers at the bottom. Um, and you're gonna take these guys and just lightly sprinkle them over the surface of your soil. And um, the Ecotype Project folks told me to tell you guys that this one um, really barely gets covered by soil. I mean, I'm just gonna barely dust it. It needs a little bit of light to germinate. Um, and uh, so as you're sprinkling it around, uh, because this seed was harvested by hand, uh, you'll see little bits of chaff and maybe a little petal or two or something like that. Don't worry about it. That can all go in um, and, and uh, in, into your soil because after all in nature, it's, you know, nobody's going around separating the seed out in nature. So it's just fine. Um, and I had, um, I, I told the library to give everybody a big pinch of this seed because it's not the quickest to germinate and we wanted to give you the best chance possible that it will for you. So that's what, um, that was our advice. Okay, so now I am literally just putting, the, I mean, I'm pretending, Think you're putting cayenne on a dish. You don't want, you barely want, so I am just barely um, sprinkling my dirt and I don't even mind if some of the seed is showing. I'm just patting it down a little bit. That's all the coverage it needs. Um, and, uh, and that's it for the, for the Joe pot. You're, what you're going to do, we don't have to sow the, uh, the New York ironweed tonight. We may if we have time, but we don't, we don't have to. I wanna make sure I cover all the other uh, information. Um, but the New York ironweed and the Joe pie look really similar. The difference is if you could get a close look, the fluff on the New York ironweed looks kind of like um, strawberry blonde. And uh, the fluff on this looks kind of ash blonde. So if God forbid you accidentally mixed up the two, if you have really sharp eyes, you would also see, um, besides the color of the fluff, the New York ironweed is kind of a tapering seed. And, or excuse me, the ironweed is, is a little bit more of a blunt end and this is more tapering on the Joe pie. So that's, that's, that's a piece of information to share. Now I'm gonna set this aside for the moment because I haven't made a tag for it yet. So I don't wanna seal it up. But I wanted to um, share with you a couple other tips. Um, this is an ordinary um, makeup brush that's seen better days. Uh, it's really good for picking up little bitty seeds. Um, so if you're finding you're like, oh my gosh, I can't, you know, my hands are too big for this seed. Sometimes I just take the little brush and go, you know, pick it up and flick it off and pick it up and flick it off. And that's um, when you're working with teensy seeds. It's a handy thing to have. I'm sure you've got one rattling around in a drawer somewhere. Um, other things to tell you about, um, I mentioned the tape as a, the way I like to seal my bottles, but I just learned from one of my resources, there's another easy way to seal a bottle and you might like this method better and it's a way to reuse a bread tie, yay. So um, instead of using tape, and this is handy if you discovered you were out of tape, you can put two holes opposite where it hinges. Just put two holes like this and then you put your bread tie through and you thread it through and you just close it shut like this and keep it, twi keep, keep it closed this way. So this is a handy little trick, an alternative means of closure. See, I told you the winter sewing people are very ingenious. They are always coming up with new tricks to do things better and new things to sew this way. Uh, so if you have, have some fun with this method, um, I mentioned an, a good starter to try besides this 
uh, when you're looking at a seed catalog or if you're at the hardware store and see their seed uh, selection or at, the, at, at, at one of our local wonderful nurseries, um, pick a kind of lettuce you like and start it in one of these. And uh, for lettuce, you don't have to start this soon. Um, the trick with all our um, winter sowing is we're basically mimicking what the seed wants to do anyway. So um, in the case of lettuce, lettuce sprouts pretty fast. So you wouldn't need to put it out in January. You can put lettuce out. Uh, I did this last year, March 15th, I put lettuce um, and I wanted a lot of it. So I put it in a gallon milk jug and you know, I had lots of little um, lettuce starts just, um, and then I, I took them out and, and planted them in my, in my uh, vegetable bed. So um, I now want to get back to talking a little bit more about um, what you're going to do with your bottles, uh, the best place to put them outside. So uh, tomorrow morning, um, or whenever your bottles are ready, go out and pick a sunny place in your garden. And, um, and don't make the mistake of thinking this needs to be protected or sheltered because that actually um, will hinder the process that you want that the seed needs of this cold and warm temper temperature fluctuation. So you can put it right out in a sunny spot in, in your yard. I don't recommend putting it on the deck because the deck is kind of uh, temperature extremes. It's not like, and it's not, it's better to have the bottom of it in contact with the soil um, just for, for the moisture drainage and everything else. Um, and you want to put it someplace uh, where if you're afraid they're going to tip over or blow over or something like that, I mean, they're kind of anchored, but um, again, uh, with a little resourcefulness, look in your garage, see if you have, I had this, which is came from um, a nursery when I bought some potted plants and uh, they sent me home with this tray and this tray makes a really great uh, place to put my bottles. So I just line up my bottles in this tray and they stay exactly where I put them, but I punched out the bottoms of the tray so that they have contact with the soil. So, um, this is a nifty thing I reuse every year to hold my winter sewing bottles in. Uh, but if you don't have that, you can um, put them all together and maybe uh, tie some twine around them or tie some twine through the, through the handles if you have jug handles on, on your milk jugs um, or just kind of hem them in with bricks or rocks or something. Uh, and then, you know, if, it, if it's been a wild and windy time, you might want to look outside and make sure they didn't uh, fall over or get knocked over or your curious pet didn't knock them over. Um, once you've taken care of all that, you really don't have to worry about them for quite a while. So, so let's imagine that it's, uh, and people say, oh my gosh, they got buried in the snow. No problem. That's, that is just fine. This is mimicking what the seed would encounter anyway. So it's all good. Um, Alice, yes. um, Irene is asking how many hours of sun should they get? Okay, so while they are um, out there, you want them to get as much sun as possible uh, this, for this winter spring period. So um, I hope you have a spot, uh, you probably have a spot that gets at least six hours of sun because all the leaves are off the trees. So um, any place like that is good. I put mine in full sun because um, we've been calling these mini greenhouses and they really do work that way. They also work uh, like a cold frame, if you've ever heard of a cold frame, um, because uh, the what you're really doing when you do these is it still gets cold at night. It can still get below freezing in here, but it is protected from um, if, if, for example, it later on in the spring, it, it got down to 32 one night. Well, inside here, you probably already have shoots coming up and everything, but they're protected 
by being surrounded by the bottle. So 32 degrees is not gonna bother, bother the plants in here um, later on when the sprouts are up. And the sprouts don't really show up until the day lengths have gotten a, a good bit longer and the days are a lot milder. So, I mean, I'm always out there checking just in case, but really I'd be surprised if you see anything before April 15th. And it will depend on the kind of spring we have. So um, could be that uh, around um, the beginning of April, we get crazy balmy weather. It's happened, remember? I think we it hit 80 one time one one April morning. And then, then you know, two days later there was snow on the ground again. So um, what we do is we leave them sealed up like this. Um, even after the weather started to get a little bit balmier, but because this is working like a greenhouse, the time will come when you want to free the seedlings um, by opening this up so that it doesn't get too hot in here. And I, I tend to say um, you don't have to do it until you're seeing a lot of, uh, a lot of growth coming up. If the seedlings are barely sticking their noses out, you really don't have to open it up. And then once I have them open, I leave them flipped open. And you'll see this in the handout, but you may see this right now if you look closely. You can see, oops, this, there. And it's there. There it is. Here they are with their tops flipped back. That's why you have the hinge. And they're enjoying the sunlight. Um, on that particular night when, uh, after I took this picture, I saw that the temperatures were going to get down in the 30s. And so I went and I flipped the lids back on again. I didn't retake them. I just flipped them down. And, and that was enough protection. Um, that's generally, uh, these are native perennials. Uh, they are used to, they usually start poking up out of the ground in April. You can see the first signs of life. So um that's that's when um, you'll probably see signs of life here um, and back to the question of uh, one of uh, one of our participants was asking when do you take them out so um when i take them out and again this is all on your handout so don't take notes frantically uh to remember but i usually take uh, i usually pot them up around May 15th. And um, I like to put them, so I put them in little nursery pots that are about three or four inch pots at that point. And what I do at that point is, you know, you, you'll have a hunk of seedlings, a, a, a big old, a, you know, a bunch of seedlings. And I take a tray and I kind of, I just dump the contents out onto the tray and then I gently separate the little seedlings from each other and pot them up individually in those small pots. And so Maria is asking if there are some heavy rainstorms, could it possibly flood the bottles? Nope, no, because that's why you have your drainage. Okay. I mean, I guess the only thing you'd need to worry about is if let's say a gutter was sloshing so much rain out down where you had your bottles that they were literally sitting in two inches of water. But the whole idea is that's why we have drainage. So they're getting the same treatment that something in your garden gets. So it's not gonna flood. And that's why we have nice potting soil in here. The water drains through it. Um, and uh, um, it, I, it wouldn't be a problem. Um, if, if, uh, if they're not getting quite enough sunlight, um, then they, you might see a little bit of green algae on the surface of the, uh, of the soil. Don't worry about it, that, that happens. But basically, uh, if you think, oh my gosh, this is, I can see, it just looks sopping wet. Well, if you're really worried about it, I guess you could slip out there and make a, another couple holes in the bottom to help it with drainage. But honestly, the whole idea is this is the part that we're leaving to nature. So um, I haven't found it necessary to do that. So um, anyway, so on about on or about May 15th, these guys are gonna be ready 
to um, go live in your gardens and or live in live in pots like I like to put them in pots um, and baby them for a little while longer keep an eye on them um, because I may still be going through my massive weeding campaigns in the garden and I don't want to be looking out uh, watching out for a seedling that's three inches tall right then so um, I may wait let them get a little bit more uh, root structure on them and then plant them in the garden um, and then sometimes I'm going around giving them, you may end up with so many, you can give them away to friends. So that'll be nice. Um, so uh, let's see. I've covered, I've covered alternate means of closure. I've covered how you take them together. I've told you how you barely, bear, the time you're the seed, the bearer you cover it, which means the job high gets just a, a skimpy little dusting and the New York ironweed doesn't get much more than that. Um, and Jeffrey, uh, has, Jeffrey has one question yeah. again about, I think he is not certain when you leave the tops off or on. Oh, oh, the tops, no, tops are never on. This is where the water gets in. But so, the top of the, I think the container. Oh, so, oh, okay. All right, so um, when what I do is when around April 15th, I start watching and if it's been a mild spring and very balmy and the seedlings are really starting to grow and I can tell um, the condensation when it starts to get a little too hot in here. Remember I told you there will always be condensation. It starts to get a little too warm in here. You may notice, oh, there's no condensation anymore. It looks, and you can feel it and you're like, ooh, this is, this is getting warm. It's time to open them up and, and, and pop the tops back. Um, and by leaving the hinge in place, you can, you can allow for mother nature being inconsistent and flip the hinge, flip the thing back on again. Um, if it's get, you know, if that warm spell, well, that was history and it's getting down to uh, um, 35, flip it back on, leave it back on. So the only, you really, as I, I've been saying, set it and forget it. The time you start paying attention to these is when, um, when the seedlings are up and the weather starts getting mild. That's when you need to start babying them a little bit more than you were, because at this point, um, the seedlings have, been well acclimated to shifts between hot and cold because it gets warm in here during the day and it gets cold at night, but they aren't so tough that they could take um, being exposed to freezing temperatures um, and deep uh, hard frost overnight. They would not do well uh, with 26 with their lids off. But if their lids were closed, they'd be okay. So, and you don't really see below say 26 in the last half of April. So um, you'll see, they will do really well. Um, so you, you can flip the lids off anytime it's a nice day. And if it's not gonna be cold at night, you leave the lids off. Uh, just keep an eye on the temperature. Um, and, uh, as I said, once they start, as somebody once said to me, when they start strangling each other in their little containers, which will be around May 15th, that's when you know it's time to pot up and just dump them out on a tray, gently separate the seedlings and put them in their individual little um, three or four inch uh, nursery pots. Or if you're in the tough love uh, family, you put them straight out in the garden then. Um, some people do. I, I like to baby them a little while longer. So um, let's see. And Alice, Kara's yes. asking what size bottles you've used there. Um, well, uh, these, these are one liter bottles. This is a half gallon bottle. This too is a one liter bottle. So I, I tend to like, I, if, if we drank soda, I would probably use two liter bottles too, but we don't have any, so I didn't do those. Oh, and before I forget, if you're improvising and you're using those, those salad boxes, 
um, the clear salad boxes, you need, bec because it's not a bottle cap situation, you need to make holes in the top as well as in the bottom because that's how the water gets in. So um, let's say you had one of those salad dishes that are yay big. I would crunch a dozen holes in the top, same as the number of holes you got punched in the bottom or one of those because they're about the same area as a milk, as a gallon milk jug. So I said we plant them now in the greenhouses. And in the, in these bottles, yes. She yeah. thought you mentioned the directions for either C30 or C60. So that would take us to mid-February or mid-March. Thanks for okay. clarifying. Oh, sure. Yeah, and it, it is a little confusing. Okay. So if you, um, this is, if you're going out and buying seed at Prairie Moon and they say their germination code is C30 or C60, either one can, could be winter sowed right now. Because again, in nature, those seeds hit the ground last fall. Um, the reason Prairie Moon says C30 means 30 days and C60 means 60 days. That means for those, um, a 60 day or means it's got to have 60 days of being cold. So um, that's fine because if you're doing this in January or February, you still have 60 days ahead of you of cold. So not a problem. They put those codes on there. Um, uh, some people use a technique that's called cold moist stratification, which involves using your refrigerator. And in that case, they want to tell you if it says C60, it has to be in the fridge for 60 days minimum. If it says C30, it has to be in the fridge for 30 days minimum. But I just use that code as a guideline for keying me in to which seeds will do very well with this method. So um, it, it, um, if you bought some seeds and they said C60 on them, you could put them out tomorrow um, outside in the bottles and they would do fine. If they said C30, same things, you could put them out tomorrow and do fine because what happens is the seed really doesn't wake up until the conditions are right, which means this alternating warm, cold, warm, cold, and the moisture and the day length all of those things trigger the seed to germinate. So um, we're just helping them along a little bit by putting them in these little mini greenhouses. Uh, um, the, the other thing about, and some people have said, why, why do I need to even put them in the bottle? If, if I'm really gonna do what nature does, why don't I just throw them out in my garden? And you can, but this is a little bit of uh, protection. Uh, so they sprout a little bit sooner than they would out in the garden. And also by not put, when the reason some of those flowers have jillions of seeds per flower is they have a very high rate of getting eaten by birds and mice and chipmunks and anybody else who's looking for a protein snack um, hits the seeds. So when we have them in here, um, we're getting a much better percentage of germinating plants than we would if we just tried to scatter them. Plus, scattering them, you know, you're not going to be able to go there and just get the exact right level and everything. There's a lot of, of loss involved when nature sows its seeds. We're gaming the system a little bit by doing this and ending up with more um, more seeds at the end of the day, uh, or more seedlings at the end of the day. Um, so um, let's see, what else? Oh, I wanted to tell you more about in, if you start having some fun with this and decide, oh, I'm gonna sow my tomatoes. I'm gonna sow my zinnias this way. The one thing to remember about winter sowing um, is that when you're working with a plant who was born in the tropics, which is, well, uh, they were born in, you know, tomatoes come from the Caribbean. So does uh, zinnias do too. Um, these plants do not enjoy cold weather at all. So um, 
you could, uh, some people do winter sow, quote, winter sow zinnias, but they actually only put them out um, like in late April. So they would do the same thing we just did, but put the bottle out in late April. And you might say, well, why would anybody bother to do that? And it's because you're still getting a little bit of a jump. You put the thing out in late April, the zinnias sprout, they get acclimated, but they're still protected from the worst. And so you've got some seedlings that are up and going weeks before you could have um, sowed them outside. Because if you read a zinnia pack, it says, so after all danger of frost is past. Well, when you have them in here, you're protecting them just enough that you can sneak that timeline up a little bit. So that's nice. Um, so the people who, who are winter sowers who do things like tomatoes, which are also hot weather lovers um, and zinnias, they're waiting until way late. Um, they're just stealing a little bit of time on what they could have gotten if they started from seeds in the garden. Um, the other thing um, to keep in mind um, with, with any seed that you think, gee, I wonder if I can winter sow this, is if you look at the back of the seed packet and the seed packet says, sow when all danger frost is passed, then you know that's gonna be a temperamental, it may not do that well. Um, and, uh, but if it says, you know, sow two weeks before last frost, then you know, well, this can take a little bit of cold, not a lot. Whereas these guys with their C30s and C60s, you know they can take a ton of cold. So um, that's a good way to gauge it. The other thing I would mention is um, what I also do besides winter sowing is I have grow lights and I start some of my seeds like my tomatoes because I'm greedy for tomatoes and I wanna get them started as soon as possible. Those I do start under grow lights with the heat mats, the whole nine yards, takes, it takes more effort. It's worth it to me um, because I love tomatoes. And I also sow some zinnias that way too, get a start on them. Um, but uh, winter sowers discovered that you can sow a whole lot more seeds than you have room in your house for grow lights by using this technique. So the thing is, find the plants that do best with this. I mentioned lettuce, you could also do kale. Chard would do very well um, in these in winter sowing, uh, arugula would. Anything that just doesn't care about the cold, and those are typical examples, uh, plants in the Nebraska family, would all do really well with this kind of, um, of a technique. So you can have a lot of fun with it. Um, look at the seed packet, see what it says about when you're supposed to sow it, and if it's supposed to be after all danger of frost has passed, or a little bit before, if it's before, then you know that it's a good candidate um, for this technique. Okay, and um, Kara's asking, if you start zinnias in bottles, do you then not have to harden them off? That is correct. That is absolutely right. This process is mimicking that hardening off technique. They're getting that by virtue of getting their start here. Just as you know, the, the cold frames that you may have heard about that um, some uh, gardeners have, a cold frame is basically a giant winter sowing contraption. Um, of course, the, the drawback is if you sow things, the cold frame, I don't know if you guys know, but it looks like a raised bed. It's got wood around the sides and it has a big piece of glass over the top. So it works like a mini or, or a medium, I don't know, small to medium greenhouse in size. Of course, the drawback to the cold frame is that you're out there in the dirt in the middle of winter sowing <laughs> seeds there, whereas we're doing this nice thing in our cozy kitchen. So um, it, one of these days, I'll probably put in a cold frame uh, and play around with that. But I find that this is so satisfactory that uh, it's, it's just a really great technique. And one more question. Uh, uh -huh. Can we do less hardy plants in a fairly warm room in the basement that gets good light from two windows? No. 
it wow. is almost impossible to start seeing with light from a window. Mm -hmm. You need that supplemental, a, 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 a bank of fluorescence, and they will tell you to put, you hang, when you're starting your seed, you hang the fluorescent light like two inches, three inches above, or LEDs either way, but that's to start, they're greedy for light, um, little seeds, little seedlings. So that would not work. Um, they would just be gangly uh, and sad if you tried to do that. So if, if you really want, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a trick you could do if you don't have grow lights and you'd like to start something like um, that is comes from a hot place. Most of the annuals that you know that you grow um, in, in your, you see growing like um, besides, besides zinnias, marigolds or um, cosmos or any of those kinds of, of uh, flowers that come and go in a single season. Um, they all came from hotter climes than here. Uh, that's why they're annual. Some of them are actually perennials in their own country and they aren't perennials here because they can't make it. But you could, if you really wanted to futz with it because you didn't have grow lights, you could, could start your zinnias or your, your not so hardy uh, flowers um, in one of these things and um, bring it in at night. But you have to be really on time. Take it out in the, take it out in the sunlight outside in the daytime and bring it in at night and take it back out um, unless uh, it's gotten to be about 50 outside. Uh, that would be one way. Like I, I've considered uh, if I run out of room under my grow lights, I've considered trying that with tomatoes, but I'm afraid I would, I'd forget one night and poof, all my work would be for naught. So um, it's, it's really hard. I mean, some, if some people, maybe you have a sunroom and the, and it's facing south and the sun just pours in. Um, I know people who will start seed that way, but then what they do is they take it outside. They take their little tray of seedlings outside every day to get real sunlight and bring it back in at night. So, um, but that's not winter sowing, so. I think your answer just answered this next question. Can you use regular fluorescent instead of grow light indoors? Uh, yes, people do. Um, 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 but uh, T5 fluorescents are the best. Those are the little skinny ones. So, um, you know, if you've got somebody handy who can rig a pulley for, for you, you can get, you know, kind of like a shop light with a bunch, you know, you want several rows of fluorescent tubes in a shop light type thing, and maybe you have a pulley so you can raise and lower it over your plants. That can work. People do that in the basement all the time. Well, this has been wonderful. I don't think that is the end of the questions. I don't know okay. if anybody else has another question. Um, tomorrow, I will send all of you the handouts from Alice and um, the original handout that Amanda sent to you has some additions that Alice has put in. And so I'll send that again. So make sure to to look at that. It, even though it looks familiar, there's more information on it. Um, thank you so much. This has been wonderful, Alice. Now I have to go, to go get my plastic <laughs> bottle and start. <laughs> well, it's been fun for me too. I just, uh, the pollinator pathway can use all of you helping um, sow these native seeds to um, help restore habitat. So thank you so much for listening in.